I want to begin this message on the occult by reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 17 to 20. And by way of introduction to this scripture, may I say this, that if you study the 10th chapter carefully, you will discover that the Lord Jesus did not give the 70 the power to cast out demons. He did not ask them to do this. But they did it anyway, and when they returned, we read, verse 17, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this do not rejoice, because the demons are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. Now, I want to begin by giving you a definition of the word occult, because the word occult does not always have a meaning connecting it with uh, witchcraft. The word simply means hidden. But as it's used popularly today, it, may, it has to do with that which is beyond the bounds of ordinary human knowledge, mysterious, concealed, or hidden from view, pertaining to certain reputed sciences such as magic, astrology. Now, of course, astronomy is a science, a science dealing with the stars, but astrology is not a science. It's a pseudoscience. And other arts and practices involving the use of divination, incantation, magic formulas, and drugs. Now, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2 says that we Christians have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. The, the Spanish Bible says we have renounced the occult. Ephesians 5.11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That is, have no fellowship with the occult. Rather, it says, reprove them, or one translation, I believe, says rebuke them. It really means to uncover them. All right? Now, next, I want to give you a list of areas that are regarded by experts in the field of witchcraft as being of an occult, that is, of a forbidden nature. And I'll have to take a little time here and uh, qualify some things I say. And I would uh, just ask your indulgence that you'd listen carefully to the end without coming to some perhaps premature conclusion. Acupuncture. Now, acupuncture, in my opinion, is not by any means always occult, but it does have occult roots. That is, in its beginning, if you go back into it historically, it was definitely connected with the occult. And uh, for this reason, I have reservations about recommending it. I'm not saying that it's occult today as practiced by doctors and so on, but I'm disturbed because it does have occult roots. Then amulets, the wearing of amulets, or good luck charms, automatic writing. Now, this is where a person will go to sleep with a pen or pencil in their hand and a pad of paper, and uh, when they awaken, they'll find words written on the paper which were given to them while they were in the sleeping state. This is known as automatic writing. This is occult. Astral projection, otherwise known as out-of-body travel. Uh, black magic, this is the use of... Um, the occult to hurt uh, other people, the putting of curses or hexes on them. And may I say, in regard to white magic, that white magic is also part of the occult scene. Although white magic practitioners do not regard it as being such because they say they use it to help people, not to hurt people. But when you look at it objectively, in the light of the Word of God, you will see that it, it is also part of of the occult scene. They may sing Christian hymns, they may talk about the Trinity and all of this, but really, basically, it's an appeal uh, to forbidden powers uh, to bless other people. And uh, this is, of course, sort of a backdoor into the occult. It's, I think, in my opinion, it is uh, forbidden as well. Then there's the reading of coffee grounds or tea leaves. Uh, this is part of the occult scene. Color therapy, the using of color threads in a box, uh, using them in an occult way. The calling up of spirits, and there are many ways of doing this. 
charming, expressly forbidden in the Word of God. Uh, I have met people who have been charmed by blood charmers. That is, they had a bleeding in their body which uh, could not be stopped, and uh, this blood charmer was able to stop the hemorrhaging. And I've talked with people who've had uh, charmers. They're actually occult healers. They might, might not call themselves that. Whatever they call themselves by, if they're working in this way, then they're part of the occult scene. But I've talked with people who've had uh, warts and wens and blemishes in their skin removed uh, by a charmer. One man told me he had a uh, he had a piece of skin on his shoulder that was perhaps the size of a 50 cent piece. It was sort of a like a wart. And uh, he had a charmer go through his incantations over it and in a matter of a couple of days this thing was completely gone. Then candles, the use of candles and calling up spirits. I talked with some Christian kids who had been invited to a sort of a seance in a non-Christian home and against their better judgment they went. They knelt around a table. Well, all of them had their hands on the table, the Christians and the non-Christians. And then the leader of the group, he lit a large candle sitting in the center of the table and then he began calling for the spirits to come. Now here's what the Christian kids told me. They said suddenly the flame, which had been about an inch or an inch and a half high, it suddenly expanded till it was perhaps eight or nine inches high then it split down the center, and one flame moved to one direction, the other flame moved to another direction. When the Christian kids saw what was happening, they were frightened, and uh, they got out of there. Well, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. Then the reading of the crystal ball. Then there's the word divination, which is a very large umbrella, and there are many things, uh, for example, the Ouija board, found under this general uh, title. Then the use of drugs. It's interesting that the the word in the New Testament, especially in the book of Revelation, but also in Galatians chapter 5, uh, from which we get the English word sorcery or sorcerer or uh, even the word witchcraft as in Galatians 5, the Greek word here is pharmakia, from which, of course, we get our English word pharmacy, and it really means witchcraft connected with drugs. Then there's extrasensory perception. And I understand there's a very narrow band that may be a natural gift in this area, but experts warn people who, who seem to have this, this particular natural gift not to use it, not to work with it, because you will likely cross over into the area of the occult because the larger band in the area of ESP is definitely occult. Then there's something called eye diagnosis. There are people known as eye diagnosticians, they're not medical doctors. They're not qualified people in this area. But uh, they claim they can look into your eyes and uh, tell you what's wrong with you physically. And uh, they give treatments through the eyes in some cases as well. I've talked to people. One man told me it was costing him between 40 and $80 a month to see this eye diagnostician. And not only was he not helped, but not long after I talked with him, he committed suicide. He took his life. Then there's a matter of fetishes. Now, these are... Uh, articles used chiefly in uh, in what we might call heathen cultures and uh, connected with witchcraft. We should have nothing like this in our home or on our person. I'm astonished to find that occasionally missionaries have brought fetishes home uh, from the foreign field and given them to churches or given them to Christians and they have these things in their home. We should get rid of anything of this nature because it leaves the home open to occult oppression. Then there's fire walking, where people in bare feet will walk on live coals and not be burned. Fortune telling, horoscopes, some forms of hypnotism. I'm not saying that all hypnotism is wrong, although I'm interested to see that some doctors are now saying that uh, people should not, under any circumstances, be subjected to hypnotism because it's the intrusion of one person's spirit by another person's spirit. And uh, Dr. Estabrook, who has a textbook on this, I understand that Dr. Estabrook is regarded as being the leading authority in hypnotism in the world. And he says that people should never, never allow themselves to be hypnotized by an amateur, uh, one of these um, perhaps traveling magicians or whatever they call themselves, because they can leave things in your mind that will cause you psychological problems for 20 or 30 years after you had this experience. Then the game called I Ching, Kabbalah, the Kreskin game, letters of protection, levitation, that's raising objects without applying energy to them. 
mind reading, so-called moon mancy, planting by the moon and this kind of thing, uh, the ring or needle on a thread, uh, necromancy, which is trying to talk to the dead, occult healing, I referred to this briefly before under charming, any method of healing uh, that is not approved by medical science, or that is contrary to the kind of healing we find in the Word of God, it's really basically an appeal to hidden powers, powers are not of God, for healing. It's wrong. We shouldn't have anything to do with occult healing. Then omens, this is in the area of superstition, the Ouija board, otherwise known as psychography, and uh, by the way, the word Ouija comes from two words, the French word we oui, meaning yes and the German word ja meaning yes. So it's the yes, yes board. That is, it's the board that gives answers. The use of the pendulum, palm reading, psychometry, that's where they take objects from your person, a handkerchief, a ring, a, or a pen or something else, and they study this object and then they'll tell you things about yourself that otherwise they would not know. Scientology, seances, sorcery, Screening. Now, screening is where uh, people supposedly will put a protective screen around you uh, so that the devil cannot hurt you. But this is all part of the occult scene. Satanism, that's the worshipping of the devil. And then soothsaying, that's really fortune telling. A table tapping, where a table is programmed and it will raise one foot uh, on one leg, as it were, and then tap out answers, say one tap for yes, two for no. It can probably only give yes and no answers, but I've talked with people who have actually done this. A telekinesis, now that's moving objects on a horizontal plane uh, without applying energy. Then tarot cards, and ordinary playing cards are sometimes used for foretelling the future, and this, of course, brings them under the witchcraft ban. Transcendental meditation, I don't have time to go into this, but it is definitely part of the occult scene. Uh, telepathy, mental telepathy, then wizardry. Now, a wizard is, a, is, is the person known as the knowing one who seems to have or claims to have contact with unseen powers and uses these powers usually for ill, although he may claim to use them for good. Then the yoga cult. And there are four stages to the yoga cult. The first stage seems to be quite harmless, but you know many of these things are baby steps to a deeper involvement in the occult. The devil doesn't mind how innocently you start as long as you, wa as you wind up or wander over into his field. So the first stage is meditation and exercises and seems to be totally harmless. But the second stage is controlling bodily functions. Like people claim they can control uh, perspiration and uh, their blood pressure, their heartbeat and this sort of thing. Then the third stage of the yoga cult is... Uh, Controlling the forces of nature, calling down fire from heaven, and uh, this sort of thing. Uh, experts in the field uh, tell me that they have talked with people who were in league with what were known as fire demons, and they would actually make fire to rise up out of rocks and fire to materialize in the air. That's the third stage of the yoga cult. And the fourth stage of the yoga cult is an investigation of all areas of witchcraft. We should not get involved in step number one because you're into a forbidden area. Then last of all, the signs of the zodiac. This too is part of the scene, the occult scene. Uh, I've been in Christian homes where they had the signs of the zodiac on a metal disc on the wall and they were experiencing occult oppression in the home. Now I've given you 52 areas of the occult. I understand there's probably altogether around 150, but I'm talking here mainly of the better known areas and it's impossible really to keep just to keep abreast of what's happening here I recently heard in Saskatchewan of a man who had invented three new occult games one he has in the market and two are about ready to go on the market I don't even know what they're called now I want to give you next some plain Bible warnings concerning this kind of involvement and I'm just going to give the a scripture reference and read it immediately uh, just to save time, you may want to, to mark these down and then look at them I at your leisure. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 12. And by the way, this scripture will show us quite clearly that uh, witchcraft is not a new thing. It's as old as the human race. There shall not be found among you anyone that uses divination or an observer of times. Now, there's your horoscopes, astrology, 
or an enchanter. This is where music is used to induce a frame of mind whereby it's easier for demons to contact the person or a witch. Well, we would call them today probably a medium or a fortune teller or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits. Now, in the New Testament, the spirits, these demons are called unclean, evil, or foul. In the Old Testament, they were called mainly familiar spirits. We use the word familiar in this sense sometimes when we will say someone talked uh, in too familiar a way, that is, in, in a rather evil uh, in a rather evil way, or they were too familiar in their attitude, uh, meaning they were suggestive, they, they were evil. And uh, so a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer, remember a necromancer is a person who tries to talk to the dead. All that do these things, what are they again? Let's go through them again. Divination, observer of times, enchanter, witch, charmer, consulter with familiar spirits, a wizard or a necromancer. All that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them, that is the Canaanites, out from before you, that was the Israelites. So in the land of Canaan, back in the days of Moses, the Canaanites were deeply involved in these areas of witchcraft, and it was one of the main reasons why God drove them out of the land. Leviticus 19.31 Do not listen to them that have mediumistic spirits, neither seek after wizards, for you will be defiled by them. Remember these spirits in the New Testament are called evil, foul, or unclean. And if you get over into their area and get involved in some of these occult practices, then you in turn will be defiled, and we run up against people who ran into this kind of defilement. Leviticus 20, verse 6, And the person that goes after such as have mediumistic spirits, and after wizards, I will set my face against that soul, and will cut him off from among his people. Leviticus 20, 27, A man also or a woman that has a mediumistic spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. Now remember, this was under the theocracy when Israel was the people of God, the special nation of God, and God was their king. And some of these laws that obtained then do not, of course, obtain today. But it does serve to show, serve to show us how God regarded occult involvement. Isaiah 8:19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? Should the living... Seek to the dead? Isaiah 47, 12 to 14. Stand up now with your enchantments and with the multitude of your sorceries wherein you have labored from your youth. If so be, you shall be able to profit. You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from these things that shall come upon you. Behold, they shall be a stubble, the fire shall burn them, they shall not deliver themselves. Jeremiah 27, 9 and 10. Do not listen to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers. They prophesy a lie unto you. 1 Corinthians 10, 20 to 22. The Apostle Paul says, I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now here Paul is telling Christian people that they should not, under any circumstances, have fellowship with demon spirits. When you and I get involved in one of these areas or more of the occult, we are guilty of having fellowship with fallen angels, with demons, evil spirits. And when we do this, as Paul tells us here in 1 Corinthians 10, we then provoke God to jealousy because we Christians belong to God. And here we are guilty of having fellowship with fallen angels, with demons. Let me give you an illustration. A certain Bible school in western Canada, and I knew about this personally because a girl from my church was attending there and uh, told me exactly what went on. A bunch of the girls had heard about this needle on a string and uh, so they had the needle on the string, and these girls all were in this Bible school, and they were asking the needle questions. They programmed to spin one way for yes and another way for no, and it was working beautifully, spelling out answers to questions that demanded a yes and no answer. And they were enjoying this, not knowing what they were doing, when suddenly one of the girls, God gave her an insight, and she screamed, almost went into hysterics, and she 
I told the others she saw demons standing by the needle, manipulating the needle. Well, the whole place went into an uproar, so then the staff had to come in and have a prayer meeting with the girls and cleanse that particular place, pleading the blood of Christ against the occult powers that had moved in when these girls moved over into the area of the occult. They didn't know what they were doing, but that did not mean they were not to see it. The devil moved in. Paul says, remember, I would not that you should have fellowship with demons. Now, that's what those girls were doing, although they did it innocently, and still they were guilty before God. Galatians 5, 19 and 20. Now, here Paul gives a list of some 18 areas of the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And among the various works of the flesh, he mentions witchcraft. That's one of the works of the flesh. Ephesians 4.27 says, Do not give place to the devil. Revelation 21.8 It tells us of certain people that are going to have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And among others, he mentions the sorcerers. The sorcerers. Revelation 21 and 8. Now, we find in the Word of God that occult practices will destroy individuals. Saul, King Saul, First Chronicles 10.13. So Saul died for his transgressions which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord which he did not keep, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it and did not inquire of the Lord. King Manasseh, Second Chronicles 33.6. He observed times, there's your horoscopes and astrology, and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord. As a matter of fact, I might say this, that King Manasseh was one of the worst kings that Israel ever had. His name became a synonym for wickedness and evil. And I'm not surprised. Notice he was involved in many areas of witchcraft. Now, occult practices will destroy nations. The Canaanites, we already noticed that in Deuteronomy 18, were driven out, the seven nations in the land of Canaan, because they were involved in the occult, and this led them into all kinds of wicked immorality and sin. Isaiah 19.3 indicates that Egypt fell because she was involved in witchcraft. Babylon, Isaiah 47.1, and then verse 9, verses 12 to 14 and then in Revelation 18 too, let me read you this latter scripture from Revelation 18, where it says that Babylon the Great is fallen and is fallen, is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The devil's bird cages are foul and unclean. All right, so Babylon, then Nineveh, and Nahum chapter 3, verses 3 to 6 and the nation of Israel in 2 Kings 17, 17 and 18, and again in Isaiah 2 and verse 6. Now, something else of real interest and help here to note is that idol worship in the Bible is connected with demonism. To put it differently, every idol has a demon spirit behind it, and this explains why God hated idolatry the way that he did and the way that he does. Deuteronomy 32.17 They sacrificed to devils and not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up whom your fathers feared not. But Israel was not sacrificing to demons. At least they were not planning on doing this. They were sacrificing to idols. But God says you were sacrificing to demons because I say again, behind every idol there is a demon. And then again, Psalm 106, verses 36 to 39. And we've noted 1 Corinthians 10.20 to 22. Let's take a look for a moment or two in the Word of God to the prophetic picture as we find this spelled out in the book of Revelation. And of course, to a large extent, not entirely, but the book of Revelation has to do with the latter times. First of all, Revelation 9 and verse 20. And the rest of the men who were not killed by these plagues yet did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither did they repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. What do we find in the world today? We find men worshiping devils. I've talked with people in North America who have worshipped idols. They haven't repented, it says, of their murders, 
their sorceries, their fornication, their theft, their thievery. And these are the things we're finding in our world today. But not a sorcery and the worshipping of demons is part of the scene as the age draws to an end. Then let me read you something from Revelation chapter 16, beginning at the 13th verse. John says, And I saw three unclean spirits, now these are demons, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons working miracles who go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to get to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. In the light, then, of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, do not get involved in the occult, because Jesus Christ is coming back, and we Christians don't want to be found walking naked, involved in occult things. God hates this. And people who get involved in this become an abomination to God. We noted that in in Deuteronomy chapter 18. I talked with an expert in this area, a man who had dealt with some 20,000 occult cases over a period of 45 years, and he said he didn't know of one person, Christian or non-Christian, who got involved in the occult, who did not have himself directly or in his family, as a result of his involvement, who did not have psychological and or spiritual problems as a direct result of their involvement with the occult. So, in other words, there's always a hidden price tag on this kind of involvement. Christian friend, stay away from it. Non-Christian have nothing to do with the area of the occult. Let me tell you something that happened. I was in a crusade in a place in Alberta, and uh, one night I lectured on the occult, gave an invitation, and the 15 or 20 people came forward, and there was a group of maybe six or eight young people, and they were sort of being pushed down the aisle by another person, and I found out a young man who was not a Christian. When, we got, when this group got to the front, the uh, non-Christian said, I'm not a Christian, these kids are. I'm involved in the occult. He said, and I got these kids interested in it. I didn't know until tonight that it was a pile of garbage. He said, Preacher, you better get these kids out of it and then talk to me. Well, it was very blunt and direct, and we did uh, deal with these Christian kids and some others, and then I talked to the pastor, and I talked with this young man alone. We discovered he was involved in 16 separate areas of the occult. But as we were talking to him, he said to me, now you said in your lecture tonight something that's not true, and I said, what was that? He said that there's always a, you said you said there was always a hidden price tag. He said, I'm involved in 16 years of the occult. I don't have any psychological or spiritual problems. And I said, but you do have. He said, like what? Well, I said, you told me a few moments ago that for years you wanted to receive Jesus Christ into your heart. You wanted to believe on Christ. You wanted to be a Christian. And you can't do it. I said, isn't that a spiritual problem? He said, man, I guess you're right. I guess it is. So the upshot of it was he wanted us to pray with him and to break the power of these demon spirits in his life. And so we knelt at the altar, the pastor on one side, myself on the other, and we simply prayed and we rebuked the devil and we commanded these spirits that were had come into this young man's life, we commanded them to go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pled the blood of Christ against them and over this young man and nothing happened. You know, sometimes there's a loud cry as in the book of Acts where we read of unclean spirits coming out and giving loud cries, the same thing in the gospel accounts. Nothing like this happened. He wasn't thrown on the floor as sometimes happens. He just knelt there. So the pastor and I finished praying. We got to our feet. The young man was still kneeling there. We waited a few moments and suddenly he spoke up and this is what he said. He said, man, it was weird. Man, it was weird. I said, what was so weird? He said, when you commanded those things to leave, he said, something withdrew from my legs and my arms and went right out the top of my head. Now, I, I mentioned this incident in a meeting down in Pennsylvania, and unknown to me, in the audience, there was a man who'd been a medical missionary for years and was now a psychiatrist, a practicing Christian psychiatrist. And he talked to me after. He said, Bill, I can corroborate everything you said in your lecture tonight. He said, when I was in Africa, we had some cases where we cast demons out of people, and the people would often tell us,
something withdrew from my arms and my legs and went out the top of my head. Now, if you remember the scripture we read in Revelation 16, it talks about demons going out to deceive people, working miracles, and there's a rising tide of this in the world today. I'm not saying, of course, that all miracle working is of the devil, but I'm saying this much. There are 17 or 18 places in the Bible where miracles were wrought by the power of the devil. And you might remember that well-known one in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, where it talks about the Antichrist whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs. And notice how Paul describes this lying wonders. They're not real miracles. They are pseudo-miracles, but they look like it. They have all the appearance of being a genuine miracle of God, but they're not. Maybe you heard about this healer down in Brazil. He died in a car accident, I understand, but the Reader's Digest had a a lengthy article on him several years ago, and uh, he could operate on people with a a penknife. Medical doctors watched him doing this, and uh, sometimes he operated when his hand was behind his back and he wasn't even watching what he was doing. Uh, Many, many people testified that they were healed through this kind of, uh, of an operation, Well, medical doctors said, we frankly don't know how he does it. We see what he's doing. It seems incredible, but uh, we don't understand it. And he he would tell how before he began the operation, he would go into a separate room, and he said that the spirit of a deceased doctor would enter into him and take over, and this doctor would then do the operating. I think that what really happened was he was demon-possessed at that moment by a spirit impersonating a dead doctor, and uh, this man... Did not uh, this man Arrigo did not really understand what was happening because when he came out, people said that his face was changed, even his voice was changed to a different voice. Maybe you heard of uh, Marcos, Reverend Marcos, as he's called. He has a very kosher-sounding organization down in the Philippines called World Mission. I happened to be in uh, Kamloops, British Columbia, when he was lecturing, so a number of us went to this lecture, including my son-in-law, uh, who with my daughter is. They are missionaries in the Philippine Islands. and They'd heard about Marcos down there, but had never met him, so naturally they wanted to hear him as well. Uh, Mr. Marcos had three people in the meeting who gave testimonies. They were people from Canada who'd gone to the Philippines and who claimed they had been healed by his particular art, and it was very interesting to listen to. During the course of his lecture, uh, he said that before he operated, that... uh, The power of God came over him, and he was totally out of it. He said, I'm aware of nothing until the operation is ended. My my mind is not there at all. Some other power, the power of God, he called it, uh, took over and enabled him uh, to do the operation. Now, the Canadian Medical Association would not allow him to practice his healing art in Canada, uh, but they couldn't prevent him from showing a film. He had a half-hour colored film, which we viewed, and here's how he operated. You would see the, the person lying on the table, the exposed area of flesh, He would, uh, with his two hands, his fingertips, uh, touch the flesh, and the flesh would open up just automatically about an inch wide, maybe six inches or eight inches long. Then he would thrust his hands down maybe to the uh, second joint or a little further down inside the incision, hold them there for the count of five or longer. Then when he drew his fingers out, there would be tumors and tapeworms and diseased tissue hanging on his fingers. He would wipe these off in a bowl and then run his hand over the incision. The incision would close up beautifully. There wasn't even a scar or a mark. He would take a sponge and wipe off the blood, and the person was healed. Now, teams of doctors have watched this man operating. They say, well, this is exactly what he's doing. We frankly don't know how he does it. But one doctor got a hold of one of these sponges with blood on it, and he took it to the lab and discovered it was not human blood. It was pig's blood. Now, how this deception, uh, how it's done, we, we don't really know. Uh, there was a question and answer period at the end of Mr. Marcos's uh, lecture and presentation of the film. And uh, so I asked him this question. I said, now, Jesus Christ taught us plainly in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, that unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I said, Mr. Marcos, what does that mean to you personally? And at this point, he got very angry. And uh, at, I think... At this point also that it was no longer he that a demon spirit was speaking out through him because this voice said, I have visited this world three times and I'm not answering your question. And the whole question and answer period ended there. Uh, the whole thing was over. All right. That's the man uh, Marcos. And you've heard perhaps of Yuri Gaylor, the Israeli, 
Uh, now he claims to be in contact with people from flying saucers or better, better known, more accurately known as UFOs. He says he gets all his power and his information from these people and he believes that they are what they claim to be, that is, visitors from another civilization. They claim they're trying to get through this man Geller to the world today here and they lead us into a utopia of peace and prosperity and all this kind of thing. He's got tape recordings of metallic voices supposedly uh, from these people who come on the UFOs. Now, when he walks through a room, sometimes objects will rise off the floor and float in the air, tables, chairs, lamps, and other things. And, of course, this is known in occult circles as levitation. These are really occult manifestations, nothing more or less. And this brings me to the matter of the UFOs themselves. There's an interesting book that uh, I would suggest you read if you're concerned in this area you want to get more information. It's called... UFOs, What on Earth is Happening? The subtitle is The Coming Invasion. Now, these men have researched this area very thoroughly, come up with some very, uh, very difficult to deny conclusions. For example, they've discovered that anyone that has a close-up contact with a UFO almost invariably will develop uh, some occult ability like clairvoyance or something along this line. And in my own personal experience, I remember once dealing with a, a woman. She was a farmer, and she was tremendously troubled because she was seeing UFOs very frequently at night. And she'd be driving down the highway at night, and there'd be a ball of fire come down the highway and just skim over the top of her car, almost drive her into the ditch. And uh, she was perfectly normal in every other way, but she was seeing these UFOs constantly. And so I discovered in talking with her, she was involved in three or four areas of the occult, and so I showed her the nature of this. She was horrified because she was a Christian, and she repudiated, she renounced these areas, and then I uh, commanded any demon spirits that had afflicted her in any way or invaded her to leave. I never saw her for another eight months, but uh, she phoned me when she was in Saskatoon, and she told me that from the night we dealt with this problem, she never saw another UFO. And I remember in Manitoba hearing of a bunch of men that were fooling around with a Ouija board, and the Ouija spelled out on the board that if these men will go to a certain uh, junction of two highways the following morning at 9 o'clock, they would see some UFOs. So they obeyed the Ouija board, went to this junction, and sure enough, a number of UFOs went sailing by in front of these men. Now there were seven men involved. This happened about three years ago. But it shows the connection between the UFOs and the occult scene. And I'm personally and have been for years persuaded that UFOs are nothing more or less than demonic manifestations. They are not, they are not people coming from another civilization at all. Now I haven't time to go into that. Uh, I just wanted to touch on it briefly. Cattle mutilations. There's areas in the states, particularly in Montana. There's a four or five county area around the city of Great Falls, Montana, where there have been scores and scores of cattle beasts that are found mutilated, usually with the eyeballs gone, the tongue missing, the sex organs gone, and all the blood drained from the carcass. And these are things that are used in Satanism, in the worshiping of the devil. Now, the strange thing about it is that sometimes these carcasses are found on promontories where the cattle beast could never by itself have gone, yet there's no car tracks. In almost every place where they find a mutilated carcass, there's no tracks to the area where the, where the carcass is lying, either the animal's tracks or human tracks or car tracks or truck or anything. No tracks at all. Just as if the thing was lowered from a helicopter and, and deposited there. Very, very strange. They've had a team in the Great Fall, Falls area working for four years now, investigating all of this. They've come up with absolutely zero answers uh, to what's going on. Now, I want to give you uh, a few cases of uh, occult involvement or invasion, cases I've personally witnessed, and I'm going to try and give you sort of, in the time we have here, I want to give you as much as possible a cross-section uh, to give you a clearer picture, uh, a fuller picture, more complete picture, of what's going on today. The first case I had to deal with was right after the revival in 1971. My wife and I were on holidays out in British Columbia uh, at a little Bible camp, and a couple showed up. They were from Vancouver, and uh, he listened to me preaching. I wasn't lecturing on the old call, but he came to me after and said, you better talk to my wife. She's got a big problem. I said, what's her problem? Well, he said, she's a Sunday school teacher in an evangelical Baptist church in Vancouver, but 
and she hasn't been able to read the Bible or pray for eight months. So we got a number of people together and we talked with this girl. I had no idea it was occult and she told me she couldn't pray. So I thought she was backslidden. We knelt together and I got the Bible and I showed her how to come back to God, but she couldn't pray. She said, I'm terribly sorry. I can't pray. Well, I said, you can talk. Why can't you pray? She said, when I go to pray, my throat constricts. I just can't get a word out. I said, what do you mean you can't read the Bible? Can you read the newspaper? She said, I can read anything, but when I pick up the Bible, I have a terrible feeling inside of me and I just I throw it down. I, I can't read it. Now, since I've had the experience the last six years or more in this area, I've come to learn, of course, a lot of things I did not know before. And one is what is known as the phenomena of resistance. And when people get involved in occult practices, they will develop the phenomena of resistance to spiritual things, to holy things. It will come out in different ways. They may find they're losing interest in the Bible. They may find they're losing interest in prayer. They have no power to pray. Or they may find they have no interest to share Christ with other people. They, they don't want to have anything to do with Christians the way they had before. Now, this doesn't usually hit people full-blown. Sometimes it does. It usually develops over a period of time, the phenomena of resistance. We knew of one lady involved in the occult, and when she would kneel to pray, uh, she'd fold her hands, and her hands would be violently torn apart. Every time she went to pray, they'd be violently torn apart until this was dealt with. The demons were commanded to go. They left her, and then she was able to pray normally. Well... I didn't know what to do with this other girl we were dealing with, so I, I prayed in my heart and said, Lord, what do we do now? Because I just couldn't help her. And God said, ask her about the Ouija board. It was as clear as can be. So I turned to the girl and I said, tell me about the Ouija board. And her husband spoke up and said, the Ouija board, oh, that thing that's bugged her for eight months. And I said, what did you do? Well, here eight months before, she'd used the Ouija board one night and she and her husband had never put it together that from the night she used the Ouija board, she couldn't pray and she couldn't read the Bible. They never realized that there was any connection, you see, between the two. But, of course, obviously there was. So we dealt with this problem then, and we dealt with it very simply. I, I showed her from Deuteronomy 18 that, that God looks on this kind of involvement as being an abomination. I said, this is why you're having these spiritual problems. And uh, so I led her in a prayer. She was able to follow me in a prayer a sentence at a time as the other people believed God for her. And when she got to the area, where, the point where she renounced the devil and all his works, including the Ouija board, people, she was instantly set free. You should have heard her pray. She didn't need me or anybody else. She just prayed for the longest while, praising God and thanking God and all the rest of it. Well, the following morning, my wife and I went to talk to she and her husband. They had a little camper trailer, and they said we had the greatest night. We didn't, didn't sleep a wink. They said we prayed, we praised the Lord, we talked about the Lord the whole night. A year later, we checked this out and found there was no further problem. She's able to read her Bible, able to pray, and the former problems were all ended. The second case I had was much more serious than this. I was conducting a crusade. Some people came running and said, there's a girl here we're praying with and counseling with. She says she can't be helped. She wants to take her life, and uh, we, we feel you better come and talk to her. So I did. I discovered she was involved in one area of the occult. But it didn't seem to be, a, you know, very significant. She'd read a book on witchcraft practices, but she declared she hadn't practiced any. But uh, for a long while, I think it was for ten months or longer, she'd been trying to come back to God. She was badly backslidden, but she said she couldn't come back to God. Now, there were five women and myself praying with her in a small room and had a carpet on the floor. We were kneeling at chairs. And uh, I tried to lead this girl back to God, and finally she said, I can't be helped. She said, I've tried so long to come back to God, and he won't have me. So I silently prayed, and I said, Lord, what is the problem? And as clear as can be, the Lord made me aware of the fact that she had an occult invasion that we'd have to command a demon to leave her. Now, I didn't want to tell this group of women what God had shown me because I didn't want to frighten them, but one of the women in the group was a returned missionary. So I prayed. Now remember, nobody in the group knew I was praying. And I prayed silently again. I said, Lord, if this is really an occult problem then, as you're indicating, would you give me a very clear sign right now that, that, it, that it is really this? I just finished this prayer in my heart and the missionary lady opened her Bible all on her own to Acts chapter 16 and read the story of the demonized girl. When she finished reading that short account, she looked at me, our eyes met, and she nodded her head and I nodded back. And I told the group that God had very clearly indicated this was an occult problem and we were going to have to believe God together for this girl to be delivered. So we went to prayer and we commanded these demons to leave. And while we were praying thus and making this command, uh, the girl gave a cry and she was thrown full length on the floor. And she lay there a few moments and then she jumped to her feet and she was laughing and crying at the same time and clapping her hands and she 
hugging the women, and she cried, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. She told me afterwards, she said she would never forget the fantastic power of God that touched her body at that point when these powers left her. Now she was totally delivered. uh, There are two interesting sequels to the story. Uh, She had a godly mother. Her parents were in full-time Christian work, and that very same night, her mother, not knowing where she was, was praying for her daughter, and she said that while she was praying, the Lord suddenly told her, your daughter's free, stop praying and start praising. So she got off her knees and began to praise God, and while she was praising God, here the telephone rang, and here was her daughter phoning long distance to say, Mom, Jesus set me free tonight. And the other interesting thing is, this happened about to six years, almost six years ago, and that girl is in full-time Christian work today. God really set her free. I remember when we talked after it was all over, and, and she said, so that was a spirit. And I said, yes, that was a demon spirit. Don't you ever get involved in occult practices again. A young man came to me for counseling one time after a crusade meeting. And he said, I'm a Christian, but I'm having a terrible time. I'm struggling morally. I'm filled with unclean thinking. By the hour, he says, I have no victory over this. I'm falling into sins. And I'm afraid I'm going to just lose out totally in the Christian life. In talking with him, I discovered he's involved in three or four areas of the occult. We went to Deuteronomy 18. I showed him what God said about this. It was an abomination. And uh, so he was horrified when he saw what the Bible taught about it. He was just ignorant of the teaching of the Scriptures. And so I knelt with him, and I led him in a prayer to renounce these areas of the occult in which he was involved. He was able to do this. After we were through this, I said to him, Now, did you sense anything in your body when you were praying this prayer? He said, yes, my body began to tremble and my knees began to slide under the pew and I had no, I couldn't control my knees, my body at all. So then I knew we had an invasion. So I called the pastor of the church and I think there was one other lay person in the building and we knelt with this young man and we went to prayer. Just as we went to prayer, I heard a noise and I, and I looked at the young man and he was totally out of it. His hands were flailing around in the air, his head was thrown back and his mouth was opening and closing, no, no sound coming. His eyes were rolled back in their sockets And I'm sure he didn't even know we were there. So I said, Demon Spirit, what is your name? And a voice spoke out through him and uh, told us its name. I don't normally ask for any names because I find in the New Testament of the 35 cases or so there's only once where Jesus asked for the name. This time we did. Normally I don't. And then I commanded this demon spirit. Actually, there were two demons. They both gave their names. And I commanded them to go to the pit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the man was instantly set free. We had a girl one time come for counseling and uh, she was involved in, I forget how many areas, I think 15 or more areas of the occult. But this was before she was a Christian. She'd only been a Christian for three weeks. Her mother had led her into the occult because her mother was deeply involved in witchcraft practices. This girl had become a Christian three weeks before, remember, and from the night she became a Christian, she began having serious problems. For example, she would see evil faces floating through the air. She'd get into bed and uh, suddenly the bed would begin to shake and tremble like it was plugged into some kind of a vibrator, and uh, she was really worried. She didn't want to tell anybody about it uh, for fear they thought that she was uh, you know, going out of her mind and they might commit her to an institution. Well, I showed her what the Bible taught about this, and uh, then we went to prayer. There were two of us prayed with her. We commanded these demon spirits to leave her. And after it was all over, she said, Oh, she said, when you were praying and commanding the spirits to leave... She said, something rose up inside of me like a river and just flowed right out of my body. And she was set free. I had two rather bizarre cases one time. One was down in the, in the Wyoming in a crusade. And the lady came for counseling and she, had the, she was involved in, I think, seven areas of the occult. Some of these areas I mentioned earlier in my lecture to, uh, today. And uh, <clears throat> she was saying... She said, I have one problem I haven't told anybody because I'm so embarrassed I, I don't want to share it with anybody. I said, well, you better tell me because you can't shock me. I've heard it all before and maybe I can help you better if you'll tell me what the problem is. Well, it turned out the problem was gluttony, but it was a peculiar form of gluttony. She would see food and just go wild. She would stuff herself full and throw it all up and then stuff herself full again with new food and throw it all up and she kept on doing this. She was married and only her husband knew about it and she said, you know, our... Um, our food bills are so big, we can hardly afford to pay them anymore. And you know, she was quite thin. She was not a heavy person at all. Well, we dealt with the occult problem on Friday night. And Sunday night she came and she said, you know, it's all gone. The gluttony's gone. And she had been, mind you, she'd been doing this for four years. 
She'd been in this kind of bondage. Well, I came home and about a week, uh, about a week later, and uh, my wife gave me the names of some people who'd phoned up in my absence wanting help, and one was a university student here in Saskatoon. And uh, so I, I arranged an interview. She came over, and here she had the same problem. There were other problems. She had two serious uh, psychological problems due to her involvement in, in three or four areas of the occult. But she said, you know, I've got a terrible thing. She said, I... And then she told me the same thing. She was eating food, throwing it up, eating food, throwing it up. And uh, she said, I'm just at the point of suicide. She said, I have no control over my mind at all. Well, I discovered she was involved in a number of areas of the occult. And we dealt with that in my office. People, I wish you could have seen it. I wish you could have heard what happened. Because as I was praying, I led her in a prayer of renunciation to renounce the devil, all his works, all the areas she was involved. She did this. And then she just took off. She didn't need me to help her anymore in prayer. It was the most beautiful thing I think I've ever listened to. She, At one point she burst out and she cried that she saw Jesus standing there and she said, Jesus has forgiven me. Jesus has cleansed my heart. He's healed me. He's taken me back. And she just started to praise the Lord. Well, I opened my eyes, of course, and I couldn't see a thing. But she saw the Lord Jesus standing there and she was beautifully set free. All right, but remember, being involved, I think she was using Ouija board, palm reading, and I forgot the other area, two or three other areas that she was involved in. Now, we must never assume that a person has a demon problem just because they're having a psychological or uh, some kind of a spiritual problem. You must never make this kind of assumption because sometimes you can hurt people when you're trying to help them. I would say that 95% of the people... Uh, who have occult manifestations or problems have been involved in some area of the occult. In almost every case, then, people have these kind of problems because they're involved in the occult. And if people are not involved in the occult, it's very unlikely, it's not impossible, but it's very unlikely that their problem is of an occult nature. Exceptions to this are people, I uh, think of one man who had occult manifestations in his life, he would feel... Uh, fingers poking in his back, he'd whirl around, there's nobody there. Now, he was a civil engineer, well-educated. I checked him out with other people. He said, no, he's perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with him. Of course, he hadn't been telling people about this occult manifestation he was having. And I was really perplexed because I checked it out. He wasn't involved in the occult. But I found out that he was a very, very stubborn person and the wickedly, stubbornly resisting the will of God in his life had been for years. And there flashed through my mind as I heard about this that scripture in the Old Testament where it says about King Saul, Samuel said, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So to God, a rebellious, stubborn spirit is just like being involved in witchcraft. And in the civil engineer's life, God had allowed a demon to invade him because of his wickedness, his stubbornness, his rebellion against God and his will. Well, we saw a beautiful deliverance from this uh, occult invasion in this particular man's, in his life. We had a case, a girl, perhaps 16 years of age, her mother had died, her grandmother was raising her, and uh, this girl was having occult manifestations of different kinds. She had no victory at all in the Christian life, a very, very sad, morose individual, and her grandmother was just beside herself, not knowing what to do. So we had several ladies, and uh, I counseled with this girl and discovered she was into the occult. So I showed her Deuteronomy 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe, and then we went to prayer, and she renounced these areas very slowly and deliberately. And we prayed over her and commanded these demons to leave her, and uh, so on, claimed the victory through the blood of Christ. Nothing seemed to happen. She just sat there. And all of a sudden, she just opened up like a flower to the sun, and she cried, oh, I'm free. Thank God I'm free. It's gone. And, and it was just a beautiful thing to watch. She just came alive in that moment after she renounced the areas of the occult. And I could go on. I don't want to weary you with um, a lot of these things. We've had to deal with in the aggregate total with some hundreds of people. Now we've had as many as 40 people respond at the end of a lecture in the occult. Uh, sometimes there's nobody responds, sometimes one or two, sometimes 10, 15, 20, up to as many as 40 responding. People involved, and almost every person a professing Christian. I wrote a book called Demonism Among Evangelicals. 
in which I go into this more in detail than I can possibly do in this short tape. By the way, that book is available through the Canadian Revival Fellowship in Regina or the Western Tract Mission in Saskatoon. If you're interested in getting a copy, um, as I say, I go into it much more in detail than I can in, uh, this, in this particular tape. However, now before I close, I want to just take a few moments and uh, talk about the way of victory. Now, going back to Luke chapter 10, and I want to end on this kind of a note because it's a note of victory. The Lord Jesus Christ said, you remember the 70 came back with John and said, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through your name. Yes, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. In other words, Satan, the prince of all the demons, is a fallen creature. His power is gone. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Then he said this, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And you know in the Bible, serpents and scorpions are symbols of demonic powers. And Jesus Christ has given his people, remember these were the 70, they were not apostles, they were ordinary lay people. You never read of them again in the Bible. The only reference in Luke chapter 10, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Or as John said in 1 John, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Listen, we Christian people have absolute power over the devil and the demon spirits over all of them. And as Jesus Christ said, nothing shall by any means hurt you. But if a Christian gets over into occult territory, he will come under the power of Satan to some degree and extent, but he can be set free if he will admit, acknowledge, and renounce. Remember, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We have renounced the occult. And we found it's absolutely essential that people make a list of the areas they've been involved in, ask God to remind them of anything they may not remember, make a list, and then go through the list one point by one, just renouncing the Ouija board, palm reading, needle on a string, whatever the areas are. And then after the person has done this, this is why it's essential that you have someone else to pray with you the other person then will have to command the demon or demons to leave this person in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to go to the pit. Now, people ask me where I get authority to command demons to go to the pit. And I have to admit the authority is not so strong, but I do see it when the Lord Jesus, dealing with the demonic at Gadara, they begged Christ not to send them out into the deep, that is, into the pit. Why? because they recognized this was the normal practice of the Lord Jesus Christ. He cast demons out. He committed them to the pit. And these demons were asking Jesus for a special dispensation. That is, that Christ should have mercy on them and not send them into the pit. So, we've had demons sometimes speak out through the person and say they didn't want to go to the pit because the pit was a bad place. We've had them threaten to come back from the pit if we send them there and bring more demons with them and create more problems. However, we command them to go, never to return in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we take a faith stand against them, plead the blood of Christ over the person and against the demon because Revelation 12:11 says, And they overcame him, that is the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. And so, the blood of Jesus Christ, that is the foundation uh, through which we get Victory. Christ once said, Matthew 12, 31, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, my dear friend, listen. If you have been involved in the occult in any one of these areas, or maybe in an area I haven't mentioned, but you're aware of the fact it's an occult thing, you'd better take care of it as soon as you can because you'll find over a period of time the phenomena of resistance will develop in your life or it may not in yours but in some other member of your family because the whole family gets infected or affected when one person in the family is so affected or invaded by demon spirits. Remember, in Ephesians 4.27, neither give place to the devil. Don't give him any room in your heart and life.